All right, so we're going to be talking about the timers on the PIC32 and how to configure timers. Basically, it boils down to how do you set up some registers on the PIC32, uh, which is typical of, well, all microcontrollers, microprocessors for the most part. Um, I'm going to point out that uh, a lot of the information that's um, discussed in here is from the data sheet on the timer, and you can find it at this web address or that bit.ly uh, short form link right there. All right, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so again, the data sheet, super important. There is a section, section number six, that talks about oscillators. And you can't have a timer on a microcontroller that doesn't uh, relate some way back to the original uh, timing source on your microprocessor. There might even be multiple timing sources on your microprocessor, but you have to talk about them and, and set them up. So you want to look at section six, on the oscillators for your PIC32. It might be a different section number, but you want to look for the word oscillators, that keyword. All right, so when we're talking about the uh, the PIC32 and in particular, and, and how things get set up with the, 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 the oscillator, it's important to point out that there's, well, basically a chip, okay? You got your PIC32 like this, and it's got a bunch of pins on it, and traditionally, and this doesn't always, it's not always the case because sometimes you have an internal oscillator, but um, but in most cases, you've got sort of a crystal or some uh, resistor capacitor oscillator on the outside of the chip, and, uh, and it feeds in. Now, you could, uh, for instance, have an internal fast oscillator, okay? And, and let's imagine that this is either the internal oscillator or an external one, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's coming in and it's coming in at eight megahertz. So this is the main oscillator that's running into the rest of the clocking um, sort of circuitry for your uh, PIC32 or it could be one of your other microprocessors. Inside, there's often after this uh, internal, this, this sort of main source, you have some way of either increasing the frequency or decreasing that frequency. And so you'll often find something called a phased locked loop, a PLL inside. And what that will do is modify the frequency. Um, and so in this case, what you have are, are three separate blocks inside of your PLL, and that will then feed in. And then eventually what you'll get is some combination, some, some selection of either the PLL frequency or one of the other clocking frequencies that will go to the system clock, okay, for running things uh, sort of centrally in the processor or out to the peripherals, timers, analog to digital converters, things like that. Now, the PLL will then modify that um, original source frequency first by applying an input divider to it, okay? And, and generally what that does is it slows down the frequency to one that the PLL can use, one that the PLL is designed to be able to use. Because at this point, right here, because of how the circuitry is set up, you need to slow it down to about four to five megahertz. So now, no matter what that in input is here, you need to get to between four and five. Now, if you've got eight, that means dividing by two to get down to four megahertz. Then you can multiply it up and then you can divide once again by an output divider to get some frequency at some rate that you want to be able to, to run things at. Uh, generally, uh, this sort of combination can get you up to, in the PIC32 MX series, up to a system clock of 80 megahertz. Now, you might not want to run that fast because it takes a lot of energy, but you could get up to 80 megahertz, which is, say, faster than the Atmega328 if that was important to you. All right, what else do we have? Well, uh, we need to talk about some something that you'll see in the source code. You'll see these sort of configuration um, pragmas, these um, preprocessor defined values that get um, incorporated by the compiler into how the chip gets configured, set up. In terms of, for instance, the PLL. So you'll see here there's an input divider, a multiplier, and then an output divider, okay? So here you, you can set your 
multiplier value to 16. You can set your input divider, idiv, to divide by 4. Okay, and you can get your uh, O divider to divide by 8, for instance. Okay, and there are different constants that can be applied. You take a look at the uh, board support package or the chip support package header file for your particular um, chip that is referenced off of xc.h. And you'll be able to see what those values are or go to the data sheet. Either way, it, it doesn't really matter. Now, your clocking could be, for instance, from an external square wave that can be really, really slow. So at DC, well, close to DC, so no frequency at all, up to 40 megahertz, um, or depending on which oscillator input you're using, either oscillator two or oscillator one, you can get up to 100 megahertz on the input square wave. Now, if you're using something like a crystal, you could uh, have an external crystal uh, set in XT mode to, so this would be setting it internally uh, to XT mode on the in internal part of your PIC32. It would need a crystal at 3 to two, 10 megahertz, or if you're set to uh, HS or high speed, then you would be uh, setting between 10 and 25 megahertz on that crystal. Okay, and many of the crystals that you'll find on microcontrollers in the four, sorry, two, one to two or eight megahertz range. All right, so you can have these different crystals being fed in. A symbol for crystal is found right there. All right. All right, next up. So to reiterate what this might look like, we're using special function registers to configure the system and the peripheral clocks. See, there's a different things. The system clock is sort of the internal core clock and the peripheral clock is the one that feeds into things like the analog to digital converter, your timers, etc. So outside of the chip, you would have, say, for instance, a, an eight megahertz crystal. They look like little uh, metal cans. They're about the size of your pinky fingernail sometimes, um, or they might look like um, um, a little, the end of a, an eraser, for instance, but it, as a metal can. You run the eight megahertz into the input divider of your PLL. So you'll take your eight megahertz divided by two, that gives you running into the PLL multiplier, four megahertz. You take that, multiply it by 20. So your PLL will, will lock onto that divide by two, eight megahertz, okay? So it takes that crystal frequency and will boost it up. And you could take that four megahertz, multiply it by 20, and now you're ready to deliver eight megahertz into the system clock, for instance. And um, in order to make sure it's 80 megahertz and not something less, you set your output divider to div divide by one. Now, if you want it to be 40 megahertz, for instance, then you could divide by two right here. And this is how you would set it up within your source code. In this case, I've got my pragma config, um, the uh, PLL multiplier to mol 20, and this is a constant. Okay, that constant isn't something I just pulled out of, out of thin air, it's found in the header file. Um, I've set my crystal um, uh, primary timer or uh, clock or oscillator to be in HS mode, um, etc. All right. Now, this is what my source code would look like for setting this up, setting up an example, okay, an, an equivalent. Um, in this case, I've got multiplication set to 16. On, on the PLL, I've got my input divider set to four, my um, output divider set, set to eight, etc. Okay, I've turned off my, uh, let me see, this is the watchdog. The watchdog is a security feature that um, makes sure that if things have gone sort of unstable, it reboots the, uh, the chip. I've set to S, S, or HS or high speed mode, etc. Now, this is how you would implement it. Now, depending on what you want to do, your values will change from the ones that are shown right here. But they're always found at sort of at the top of your, your program file. Now, that setting up of the clock that runs into the peripherals, what kind of peripherals would we be interested in? For instance, the timers. All right. So, Basically, all microcontrollers on the market contain some timekeeping function blocks, and we typically call them counters or timers. And we talked about them, for instance, on the AppMega328. Um, they generally run off things that are called a, uh, they're called peripheral bus clocks. And those are basically separate from the system clock because your system is running at one particular frequency, and you may want to run your, 
uh, timers, your analog to digital converters at a different frequency than that to save power. Uh, maybe if you're doing communication, you might have to hit a particular baud rate. And so you have to switch your main peripheral clock to be able to achieve that, for instance. The timers run semi-autonomously, just like you saw on previous microcontrollers. And, and generally, when they overflow, they can send a warning, an alarm. Like, for instance, if you wanted to set up uh, interrupt service routines, which is a very common thing that you would want to do. Here's an example. After you've set up all your oscillators before, here's an example of configuring timer 2 on the PIC32. So I've got a period register. In this case, I'm looking at configuring timer number two. So I want to access PR2, so period register for timer number two. And I set it to a particular value based on uh, what's in the data sheet and what I'm trying to achieve. And then I can set up my configuration in the configuration register T2Con. And here's a bit pattern that I'm sending into it. And what I've said basically in here, um, well, anyway, you can you can sort of read it, but there's some prescaling going on, etc. I've set uh, bit 15 right here to one, so the timer is turned on, and I've got a prescale inside of my timer, and I've set it to in this case I'm saying um, a factor of 256, and that's uh, these three bits right there. All right, now uh, last thing we're going to do uh, before moving on to the next video, more on timers, is to talk about byte and bit addressing. Now. When you're dealing with microcontrollers and microprocessors at a, uh, an assembler level, accessing particular bits is often really easy. Well, it's easy compared to how it would be in normal C. Generally in C, what you have to do is set up all of the values for a particular register uh, all in one go. That's often how it's done, unless the microprocessor manufacturer has designed in particular ways of getting around that particular weakness in the C programming language. Okay, where there's no natural way, no inherent way uh, inside of the, uh, the C language to access a particular bit. So there's workarounds for that. Now, generally this is how you do it. So this would be latch for port F. I'm setting um, all of these bits right here. It looks like 16 bits right here using either a hex value or a uh, binary value. And we're setting to 0 or 1 each of these bits in the register. So you would you would look inside of your header file that's linked to from xc.h to find out what your uh, particular registers are called and how big they are and, and, and that sort of thing. Now, an example of that here for an interrupt service routine, and you can see how I've defined a ser an interrupt service routine right here, okay, is um, I would have, uh, for instance, some check, I've got some uh, global counter that's been changed, and then I'm setting my latch for port E to this value um, if a particular value in my global register is achieved, and then I set the, the register um, separately or differently if the if-else conditional statement gives me something otherwise. Now, if you look down here, you'll see that there appears to be another way sometimes of accessing particular bits. Now in this case what I've done is I'm trying to reset the interrupt bit, the interrupt flag, by accessing a register IFS0. There's a structure associated with it called IFS0 or IFS0 bits that's defined in the header file and and there's a bit called T2IF that's accessed in the sort of the structure. And, um, and that gives you a hint as to what we can also do in terms of bit accessing in C. And you can see that um, for the PIC32, this is one way of doing it. So if I wanted to, and it's messy just on purpose, so you can see all the different variations of it. But if I wanted to set, set bit zero of latch for port E to zero, this is how I would do it. I'd say lat E bits dot lat E zero is equal to zero. Or if I wanted to set uh, bit 3 in latch E to 1, I would say lat E bits dot period lat E 3 is equal to 1. So this is another way of doing it. It's a convenient way of, of setting up particular bits using the header files definitions in uh, MPLAB X. All right, so accessing registers using um, uh, full sort of numbers um, 16, 32 bits, etc., 
or going in a little bit more surgically and saying, I want to affect one particular uh, bit in here using structures that are defined within the header file. And that's it for the first video on timers. Thank mm -hmm. you.